So we're going to recap uh, a little bit quickly before we get into chapter one again. We're going to talk about the color key chart that we're doing as we talked about the literary terms and devices on that handout I gave you. Okay, um, right now we're thinking about the point of view. Whose point of view are we going to be learning? Is it Buck's point of view or is it going to be the narrator's point of view? Right now it's the narrator's point of view. Right now it's the narrator's point of view, right? It, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We're going to find out, which we don't know yet, the purpose of why Jack London, the author, has written the book, Call of the Wild. How we find out the purpose, and I didn't talk about this yesterday. To know the purpose of a novel or an article, even a play or a poem, you have to look at a couple of things. Number one, you have to look at when it was written. Is it a current piece? Or is it um, a historical piece? You have to look at the cu cultural context, meaning what's going on in the world then, in that particular area. What we know in the Call of the Wild is that what's happened is that men have discovered gold, right? Mm -hmm. And they have discovered it up in the Canadian area where it's very cold and it's very rugged and it is not at all uh, comfortable. Okay, and so we also have to look at the political climate. What's going on in that neck of the world politically? What's going on economically? Is there a depression going on? Right? You have to look at socially. What's going on within people's lives during this time? Okay, that helps you make an educated determination of the purpose, the message that the author wants us to, to understand. Okay? So let me digress for a second. And do you know what the word digress means? Slow down. down. What does digress mean? Slow down, down digress, bring it like. Okay. Bring it to go away, to, to kind of go off topic a little bit, but not digress. D I G, what is it? R E S S? Digress. So let me digress a little bit on that and talk about the idea of a purpose. Can you even have a purpose in poetry? Yes, you can. And I think about a poem right now. Well, two. One is by T.S. Eliot. He's a British writer. He wrote at the turn of the century and early on in the 20th. And he wrote a poem called The Wasteland. Actually, it was a collection of many poems. It's very difficult to read. However, it was written about the destruction emotionally and physically of people and the buildings of World War I. And so it's a poem that deals with that inner destruction with the people and how they had to look at their burned buildings and recreate their lives. And so what do you think the purpose, just based off what I said, why do you think Eliot would have written a poem like that? What did he want the public to know? What he felt. What he felt, yeah. And how devastating war can be, right? So think twice, government before you send off our men and women to war, perhaps, right? So it's a, po it's a purpose even in a poem. The same thing with a purpose in a play, right? Um, a play, even if it's just a comedy, there's often a purpose for just a, a slapstick comedy can just be for entertainment, to make you feel good, right? To forget your problems. You could have a play that deals with the political or economic times, say, of the Holocaust. The purpose, again, what do you think the purpose of a play like that would be? Mm -hmm. Why did you say? Well, to say, what do you think the purpose of that would be? A play or a novel that talks about the Holocaust. Information, information yeah, could be as information. But also, perhaps to show how, again, the devastation of what people can do to one another. Oh. Do you see? What were you going to say? Informative. informative, yes, obviously historical accuracy, right? But beyond that, we want to think about, and I've said this again and again, and I'll say it again and again, that literature has the power to move us emotionally in some way that we're going to be better off for reading it, listening to it, watching it, right? Has anyone ever gone to a movie and you walked away in tears? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Have you seen a dog's purpose? Oh, yes. No, find me the dog's purpose. I cried. Oh, my God, the hate you. 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 Oh, my
So it's the same thing. The purpose on that, the purpose of a movie that would impact us, say, on a dog, and we're reading a book about a dog, is to maybe show us, um, again, human emotion, how to treat other people, how to treat animals maybe. It just depends. But do you see? We have to isolate the purpose in order to go deeper in our understanding of literature. Okay? I think we understand that now, don't we? All right. So we talked about the syntax, didn't we? What is syntax again? When we study or analyze syntax. Trey, can you remember that? Um, and you can use your notes. I Hopefully you wrote it down. Remember? Use your, when, it, when you come to class, bring your composition notebook, open it up to your devices so we know. I'm studying my phone. That's okay. Somebody tell me what syntax means. Look up your, you should have written it down. I want you to get to where you remember it. Oh, wasn't it like a group of words or a, um, uh, so a words made for words meaning? words on paper Use and a sentence so it's conveying meaning. Perfect. It's an arrangement of words on a paper and a sentence well, for meaning. Right? Syntax. Okay, and a, a sentence can be long, a complex, mm -hmm. compound, simple. We can have a word, one word sentence, can't we? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have that. We talked about diction, and so we're making our key chart in the front of our book for just these right now, different colors, however you want to do it. Um, diction is another word for word choice. We looked at the difference between, say, the word hunger in our essay that we wrote and starvation. Okay? Both deal with being empty inside, both literally and figuratively, right? You can be hungry for that hamburger, but you're not necessarily going to starve to death, right, from not having it. You can be hungry for ideas, and that hunger, though, if you never fill it, just like never filling your, your belly with food, can turn into um, starvation of your identity, of your soul, of your dreams. Think about that. Oh, that's, that's good, isn't it? Think about that. Hungry. Be hungry for ideas and change, right? Because if you don't, you will starve yourself of your potential, your identity, your dreams, and then you will live a life that's unsatisfactory. Yes. How many of you ever encountered um, an adult that walks around depressed all the time, always saying something's wrong or I can never do that okay yeah I'm unhappy with my life they say if I didn't do this or I didn't have that I would be happy I'd be better well guess what that is they have yeah they have starved themselves of their true desires of how they want to live their life right can y'all get that at your age huh Yes. Let me tell you, the stuff that I'm teaching you all right now through these books, listen, this is magnificent if you get this because you are at a prime age to begin to think about your life. You know, we only have, what, 70, 80, if we're lucky, 90 years on Earth. So when you think about that time span, for you, time seems forever. But it goes fast. And you want to live a life of creativity and fulfillment. Yes. Miss Doreen's dad is 99. Yes, what? Oh, that's awesome. That's great. Okay, so are you following me? So now you begin to think about who you want to be in your life, okay? Literature is my passion, and teaching this stuff to y'all is my passion, okay? When I walk out of here, I don't care. It doesn't matter how many times I've read a book and we've discussed it. I walk away learning something new. And I love it. It keeps me going. I want you to have that as well. Okay? All right. Look down imagery. We made our color chart. For me, I picked yellow. Imagery. It's the senses. The way the authors use the words in order to con connect with us. Right? Similes, metaphors, and words. We have characterization, what the character says about himself, what the narrator may say about the character, what others say about the character, and the description of the character, right? Mm -hmm. And from those things, we can figure out their emotional maturity or immaturity, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Next thing is hubris. That's uh, a big one. We just learned yesterday. What is hubris? Hubris. 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 H
like, like uh, cocky. You okay? Like, too, yes. Too, uh, too happy for yourself. Like, yeah. Like bragging. Too cocky, too, too cocky. braggadocious, yeah. too prideful. You're filled with oh. ego. <laughs> you don't listen to anybody, right? Yeah. Like, uh -huh. Hubris. I know some people it, that are like that. Yeah. Me too. Excessive. One, two, three. And then we have theme. We have theme, of which I don't have around in my highlighters, but I wrote theme. Theme is a central idea that guides the book. You can have several sub-themes under there, but there's usually one really big theme and then a whole bunch of other ones, right? Family, loyalty, um, love, death. Whatever. Okay, so we got that. So let's get into the book now. This is yesterday. We talked about the idea of diction. Diction is to show how the men in this novel are desperate to become rich. They are willing to toil, word in quotes, that we got from the book, at their peril to obtain gold. To risk it all. I am going to leave it here because I'm going to... What did you say? So they're willing to risk all their marbles. That's right. Risk all their marbles. Everything they have gamble. to gamble. Willing to become what? To become rich. And, of course, to, there were some that got very rich, but there were many more that did not. And they lost everything. They even lost their lives during Whoa. this gold rush. Yes. What does it say? Willing to become what? I can't. Like, cut off the word. Willing to toil. Now, remember, I in, in pink... I did my diction for my um, key color chart. So whatever you pick, make sure you keep that going. So that when I ask you to maybe to write a timed writing, and I say, discuss how the author uses diction to show whatever, you will go into your book and you will know it's whatever color. For me, pink, pink. And I would say, oh, wow, I've already got three words right here that are show word choice. One of them is toil, which means to labor at something excessively until you just about break down groping to grope something is to grab something and yellow you well in today's shh, listen you're right in today's world in today's world it does have a, a negative connotation to grope right we, we that, yeah exactly right exactly but in this connotation, <clears throat> shh, in this connotation, groping means, and let's look at it, okay? Because men groping in the Arctic darkness had found a yellow metal. They were looking deeply, okay? They were um, grasping at, a, at an elusive idea, a dream. They wanted this gold, and it was just within their reach and they were willing to risk it all in order to get this gold okay does that make sense so those are the word choices we have from there look from there we have the description of the dog which we said that um london uses a lot of adjectives to describe the dog right which makes the imagery for us okay and he says he lived in a big house right and he was the judge's dog, and the judge holds um, a political title, makes good money, as we see. And in here, he talks about the widespreading lawns, the spacious scale in the front, stables and servants and orchards, and all of these things, right, to show the wealth that this dog was living in. And so you can bet he was pampered. Yes. Do we highlight those in yellow? That, like, oh. spacious and like stuff. Imagery and okay, four. Look back at your key. And vocabulary I did in pink. My imagery is in yellow. Okay? And my characterization I put in green. And my hubris I put in blue for right now. I was gonna, I'm going to go to the store this weekend and I'm going to buy us a ton of different colors. So those of you that don't have a ton of different colors will be able to have them. Yes, Tori. Can I use orange acid? Yes. You can use any color you want. That's just her. That's uh, just mine. Okay, I just did this. I just grabbed and did it. And then I'm following through. And it makes it easier to hone in 
on a particular literary device quickly. Does that make sense? So that you can talk about it. So when we have a Socratic seminar and we get in a circle and we'll talk about the meaning of something and I will say, um, Juliana, tell me about the character um, so-and-so and how does the author show his cruelty? Okay, and so you would think, okay, characterization and maybe some imagery. So you would look at those colors real quick and be able to quickly isolate some things and be able to have an intelligent conversation. Does that make sense? So there's a reason for us doing this. It will become easier as you go along. Right now, I'm, I know you're thinking, oh, golly, right? But promise you, it'll get better. Okay. Um, the setting. Remember the setting um, on your yes on your literary devices here. It's under drama, but setting can also be in poetry. It also can be prose. Why is the setting important in this particular? Um, it gives a depiction or imagery about what the house looks like and how he was pampered. And how he's pampering. You said richness, right? Yeah. Uh, well, well, see. Yes. Uh, Amaya, yeah. right? And Iris. Yeah. Okay. What? Yeah, I was just getting the names. Um, okay, so it shows the richness and the scamperedness that he's in. Okay, and we looked at here in blue. What did I do blue? Hubris. Okay, I remember we talked about this yesterday. Okay, and over this great area, home, right? Buck ruled. He was a king. He was a king. Yes, and we can infer based on now what I've talked to you about hubris... Do you think Buck is going to maybe have to learn a lesson about his pride yeah. and ego? Yeah. So that foreshadowing. Do you see that? Already we have a ton of stuff going on in this book in the first page, wouldn't you say? Okay. He also, we also know the hubris is because a narrator says there could not but be other dogs on so vast a place, but they did not count. Now, does the narrator care about them, or is it he's showing that Buck doesn't care about them? Buck yeah, they don't count. They're nothing, right? They're just like little ants. The peasants. Peasants. There you go, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Um, they came and went. They resided in the populous kennels or lived obscurely in the recesses of the house, after the fashion of Toots, the Japanese pug, or Isabel, the Mexican hairless. Strange creatures that rarely put their nose out of doors or set foot on ground. Okay, then he talks about, on the other hand, there were other dogs who yelped fearful promises. And let's go over here. Yeah. And they were protected by a legion of housemaids armed with brooms and mops. I'm on the second page. Turn it over. Okay, y'all are on the... Yeah. Oh, I got it. Never mind. Okay. Let me get my black pen. Okay. Buck was neither. Listen. What's characterization? I put uh, green. Okay. Buck was neither house dog nor kennel dog. Okay. That tells us something about the dog. Is that hubris? Not yet. But the narrator... Wait, what was your green? Was your green characterization? Mine was characterization for green. Shh, listen. Shh. Buck was neither house dog nor kennel dog. Remember, he ruled. That means he was free to roam. He was free to call the shots, if you will, on his domain. And he probably didn't have anyone telling him what to do. Right? And that foreshadows when he gets taken, who's going to tell him what to do? Himself. The men that oh. grab him. Oh, yeah. And they put the rope around the second thing. Ah, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, okay. I thought you meant like after the house. Oh, The whole realm was his. Okay? So, up here, look. Up here, I'm going to put, he is free of rules. Right? Yes, Robert. I gotta use the restroom. Go. Are you gonna ask? He me? is free of rules. Oh, Shh. He is free of rules. Y'all so He's independent. Okay? 
He's king of the castle. And so now we talk about here. He plunged into the swimming tank. He went hunting. He escorted the kids. He, he did all of these things, which are all description, right, of his life. What kind of a life did he live? It was adventurous. adventurous. It was wonderful, wasn't it? It's a description of his life. It's wonderful. His father was a huge St. Bernard and had been the judge's inseparable companion. Now we can say he's gone, and here's Buck. Buck is going to follow in his father's footsteps. He was not so large. He only weighed 140 pounds, so this tells us what he looks like, right? And his mother was a Scotch shepherd dog, so it's a crossbreed, okay? He's a little mutt. As a mutt. Nevertheless, 140 pounds to which was added the dignity that comes of good living and universal respect enabled him to carry himself in a royal fashion. Okay. You see that word royal fashion? Well, that's, listen, Trey. You can figure out any color you want. I know, but I'm saying, like, are we supposed to highlight the Elmo father part his, about his father? If you want to, but I'm just, I'm marking. You're, you're watching me annotate in order for you to model this. Well, you can move up closer. She said just, like, 50 million. Okay. I know, but, like, if you do move closer. Yeah, I'm going to have to, like, take everything with me. That's fine. I don't care. Girl, come I just want you to be able to see it and understand it. Yeah, okay. For me, characterization I did in green. You may do it in another color, okay? But when we think about the word hubris, okay, and we're looking at characterization, what L Jack London is doing is setting us up to understand how difficult it's going to be for Buck to be a prisoner. Yeah, because he's used to his royal wine. Okay, yeah, just a minute. Um, to carry himself in a right royal fashion, okay? Everybody can go to the bathroom when we start the announcements if you need to go. But right now we need to finish this up. Okay, in a right royal fashion. Royalty implies what kind of um, bearing? When, you th when you're a royal person, are you just an average Selena? No. Top notch. Yeah. And, and you think you're better. Respect, yeah. Honor. Even if you're not a very nice person, yeah. they'll still give you honor and respect. And we can see that in history when we look at some of the kings and queens that were so terrible or yeah, dictators. Because, yeah, like because Marie, they feel Antoinette, like, let the people change. They feel the royal people feel like higher than the other. Yes. So does that tell us that, again, we're crafting the narrative that Buck might just be a little too big for his britches, so to speak? Yeah. They're a little too tight. Yeah. Hubris. 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 Okay? Okay. Oh, look at this. Somebody read this to me. Read this to... Of a sated aristocrat. Sated meaning satisfied. Um, oh, everything he wanted, he got. And a wrist. Oh, big time. But so do you see how London is doing this? He's just really setting the stage. I love how he uses these descriptions and these word choices to show. So can we highlight that as diction if you want? To yes, you can do imagery, characterization, diction. Those literary terms, depending on how you want to use them, can be intertwined. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sure. That's a good one. Yeah. I love that. So, yeah, if it's diction for me, what color did I do? I did, and I haven't memorized this. I got pink. I have pink, too. So I'm going to do aristocrat, sated aristocrat as diction also. He had a fine what? Pride. Pride. Hubris is excessive what? Pride. Pride. Yes. Okay. And here it goes again. What does it say next? 
egotistical. Yes, it says just a trifle. Trifle means little. But I don't think at this point, do you think that it's really that trifle? No, it's a lot. I think it's a lot too. Okay. As a country gentleman sometimes be, become because of their insular situation. What does the word insular mean? I'm going to mark that. Insular. What does that mean, insular? Okay. What we're going to start doing is since we're in class together, we can start using our actual dictionary and open them up and look for the word and, and know the meaning. Okay, but for the sake of right now in our time, insular means to be enclosed. In, thank you, enclosed, protected, right? Uh -huh. So even in our school here at Odyssey, we're a smaller school, and we are much more insulated mm -hmm. than, we used to be. than you used to be maybe at a very larger All school. Of my class is insulated. Yeah, the water protected is that's you're you're exactly right good okay so if you're insulated and you're living in this beautiful fantasy or not really a fantasy this beautiful world do you think that buck has any frame of reference to what the real world is like no no exactly he has no idea that there could be mean people or bad situations and if you don't know that and you are all of a sudden changed and thrown into a new environment, how are you going to react? Uh, Fearfully. Oh my God. Fearfully. Going into a private school and okay. then get thrown in a public school. Okay, true. That's true. That's exactly true. Because it's so different, right? It's so different. And so people have to get used to that change and some people handle change better than others and so we're going to see which you've already read this how does buck handle change um so far do we know uh, be, confused, be confused yeah absolutely like what just happened and who are you okay have we gotten to the man